Welcome to an oral history of the church. I'm Jonathan McCormick. And I'm Adam Chrisman. An oral history of the church is a conversational church history podcast coming from a Christian historiographic perspective, discussing subjects by volume or season. On this podcast, we consider history an art form. Let's get started. Well, Jonathan, we wanted to... um go back over what we talked about last time before we get into today's subject. Two weeks ago, we talked about primary sources and secondary sources, what they are, how we use them, and this week we want to talk about tertiary sources. So before we get into that, we just wanted to recap that primary sources are typically first-hand accounts of various kinds. So this could be uh, a newspaper article or a diary entry or um, government another... documents. Exactly. Or... Other documents that deal with something from that period. Government documents, uh, uh, somebody in that era commenting on a movement of that time. I'm thinking of Jonathan Edwards speaking about um, charismatic uh, revivalist movements during the Great Awakenings. Um, so primary sources are first-hand accounts from the era that you are studying. Secondary sources will bring a question to that uh, which is being studied. They will either be... Normally you're just reading a history book or a biography uh, when, you're, when you're thinking about secondary sources. But they will they will come with a certain question like, um, wh how, what was the impact of World War One on J.R.R. Tolkien's um, fantasy books? And so they will write a biography of Tolkien based on that angle. Or or there's all kinds of questions that you can bring to a historical moment, movement, or person. So a secondary source will be from uh, some later period, uh, whether it's contemporary to us or not, is irrelevant. Um, and we gave the example of Karl Barth writing about uh, John Calvin on the issue of justification. If you want to understand what Calvin said about the doctrine of justification and you read Karl Barth's book, you are using it as a secondary source in order to better understand Calvin, a source from several hundred years prior. But if you want to understand the mind of Karl Barth, the, the mind and theology of Karl Barth, then it is actually a primary source in that study. So this is where we came down on it for primary sources and secondary sources. We talked about also that sources can omit Sources can change details or skew uh, perspective, uh, whether for good reasons or bad reasons. Yeah, we talked about a lot. I thought it was a good episode, um, but I think I should probably wrap it up there before we just rehash everything from last time. Uh, primary sources and secondary sources get us directly and indirectly at uh, a lot of the, the data that we handle when we want to understand something from history past. Now, finding these primary and secondary sources can be difficult. Uh, yeah. You can just walk into the library and start looking in the catalog or wander over to a shelf and uh, pray uh, to uh, St. Jerome, the patron saint of libraries, and uh, <laughs> hope that he helps you find your book. Um, but it makes more sense to get some help finding what are the good primary sources and the good secondary sources. Partially, you're reading them to find out... Uh, you want to find out what are good quality sources uh, primary sources you know you want to make sure you're getting one that actually has all of the record that you're you're wanting and has it accurate like or That's secondary good. sources that are 
well researched and respected and deal with primary sources fairly. Right. This may seem odd, but it is possible for something to be published without everything in the book being factual or fair. And in the age of the internet and uh, the rise of increased self-publication, mm -hmm. there are fewer gatekeepers to say, no, this is really bad. It's a bad sign when you're looking through a book and random words are all capitalized. <laughs> uh, That's right. So we we want some help finding what really are the the important works to to read and to look at. Tertiary sources help us discern uh, what are the important primary and secondary sources to be working with. Yeah, I didn't get turned on to these right away when I started college and was trying to do research, but once once I really understood how to use them, what they're for, um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I understood. I got onto that and, and used these every time I wrote a paper or was conducting some other research. You know, we call them tertiary sources, but I often... Uh, will start, an, if it's a very new area to me, I will often start with a tertiary source. Even some places where I, I have a familiarity with the concept, it's worth going back to these sources to sort of as a refresher. Yeah. And I can tell how my writing improved after I started engaging better with uh, these tertiary sources than before I really knew how to use these resources. Uh, we've been dancing around calling them tertiary resources, uh, but there are sort of four big categories that uh, we want to, to look at and talk about. Uh, dictionaries, encyclopedias, atlases, and bibliographies. Yeah. Uh, each has a different role to play in your, your research method um, and in the research process. Mm -hmm. But they all come together to sort of give you, to orientate you to the, the discussion uh, and the topic. Dictionaries are... We, we're all familiar with Oxford Dictionary and those uh, sort of basic grammatical dictionaries. Uh, but there are dictionaries that help with jargon specific to a, the field. And history, as well as every other field, has developed a shorthand of this is the big concept we're talking about, so we need a word for it. The dictionaries sort of define those words so you know what these words are in context. Yeah. Sometimes a, a dictionary will have, a specialized dictionary will have longer articles, um, generally about people and movements and places uh, that are bigger than just a one-line definition. <laughs> That's certainly true. Uh, yeah, dictionary and... articles will will really... They're probably my favorite of the four categories of tertiary sources. Um, they can get very... Uh, it, it'll surprise you if you haven't thought about it before how well-written they are how thoughtfully written they are because they want to say it right and point you to outward to the research so every word is carefully chosen in every sentence every paragraph of these dictionary articles 
to, to help you understand what's generally going on and to give you kind of a trajectory to follow. Exactly. If you've ever walked in on a conversation and realized, I don't know what people are talking about. <laughs> yeah. Dictionaries do that for scholarship. Yeah. Encyclopedias get a little more, a little deeper into the topic. Yeah. So the entries will be longer. Uh, dictionaries often won't have a bibliography. Um, or it mm -hmm. will be a relatively brief bibliography, right. one or two uh, references in each. Mm -hmm. uh, an encyclopedia is going to have a pretty substantial uh, bibliography at the end of each article. Right. Each uh, encyclopedia article is essentially an essay. Yeah. So it's researched and uh, all kinds of just excellent references usually as far as my experience is concerned, at least. And regularly, these are experts in that particular area or field. Mm -hmm. uh, so they'll get someone who has written probably a, a full-length monograph on this topic, and they'll sort of distill their big picture down into a manageable quick essay. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of like the TED Talk version of, <laughs> of their book. Yeah. Yeah, something more high level always. It, it never gets uh, so crazy that you can't follow it. Um, although there have been times where I've needed both a dictionary and an encyclopedia open next to each other. Um, but then again, I've found that the, the best written material, whether that's books or papers and the worst written material, both books and papers require you to have other books open next to them. <laughs> so yeah. dictionaries <laughs> or encyclopedias or something else. Um, so they are, they are accessible especially if you use dictionaries in conjunction with encyclopedias in case there's a tiny piece that you just you just don't know what they're talking about as they move from one to the next uh, the best way to go is to go find out what that piece is and then you can come back and you can better understand the whole essay now both dictionaries and encyclopedias will be arranged alphabetically Often, if there's a related topic or multiple names for a topic, there will be some sort of heading in mm -hmm. the in there that says, "No, go look over here. The article, this article covers more of what you want to talk about." So, if the first generation reformers are all covered in an article on the Reformation, right? an article you might turn to an article for Zwingli and it would say see the article on the Reformation right right and in uh, an example from biblical studies um, you might see Matthew comma gospel of or you might see Matthew uh, comma saint or Matthew and then in parentheses author something like this where it if you're looking for one thing it'll it'll be n nice and clear as to what specifically each article is about or it will redirect you exactly part of why you read these is to clarify your own thinking and help understand the distinctions that might not be clear initially to you in your research right Sometimes when you're reading uh, an account, you'll find place names. This is what an atlas is for. An atlas is a bound volume of maps and other regional or locale information 
related to your topic. Mm -hmm. So a good atlas at least will have a map of whatever region you're looking at, mm -hmm. but it may also include population data mm -hmm. or uh, information about each of the locales. And in some of the best atlases, you'll even have pictures of your locations. Right. This city or that hill or whatever, as it is relevant to your your focus. So there's a an atlas that uh, one of our professors uses named the Sacred Bridge, um, and it has pictures of archaeological sites. Um, mid dig so you can see oh this is what it looks like at the dig now um, and drawings of what they think it looked like back in the day um, so if you're reading an account and you see Jesus went from this city to this city um, as happens in uh, the gospels uh you'll notice, oh, this route is an odd route. You'll have, you'll have to figure out what that means, but without an atlas, you can't, you wouldn't know if this is a direct route or if it looks like Jesus is just wandering around. Right. Uh, the final type of resource is a bibliography. Uh, most books, um, your atlases, dictionaries, things like that, will have a bibliography in the back. Mm -hmm. um, Adam and I are both working on our dissertation. Uh, uh, when we finish our dissertations, there will be a nice substantial bibliography at the end of our dissertation. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. But a bibliography on its own isn't always helpful. True. Um, so one of the things that is helpful in bibliographies, often there you will find what are known as annotated bibliographies. Mm -hmm. These will tell you in a hundred, two hundred words the methodology, the sources, and the the quality of um, the books in the bibliography. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, annotated bibliographies can be extremely helpful in discerning what is going to be worth your time. Not that the books are necessarily bad or of low quality, but they may not actually deal with your subject matter. And if you're 75 pages into a book and you realize this has nothing to do with what I'm studying, you've wasted all the time you spent getting that book, reading all those pages, and coming to that conclusion. So an annotated bibliography can be um, one of the most helpful kinds of bibliographies. We won't cover ones deeply here this week of annota of annotated bibliographies. Sure. Uh, but we will we will mention them when it's appropriate as we go forward. Uh, because we do think that um, this is part of part of the job of a scholar is to communicate to to their audience how you got there and invite invite you into the conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. Bibliographies are part of that invitation into the, the scholarly guild. That's right. So, there are some resources that we find really helpful. This is by no means an exhaustive list right. of yeah. things we think are important. Uh, so if there's a, a dictionary or an encyclopedia you either think is really important or uh, if you worked on it, uh, thank you for listening 
listen to our <laughs> our podcast. Uh, That's right, Doctor Packer. <laughs> I'm sure he's uh, listening right now. We, <laughs> yes, yes, he is <laughs> on pins and needles for our next episode. Uh, uh, these are some of the ones that we found helpful, um, but certainly there are more of them. Uh, one that I find really helpful, um, and it's brief, but it's a bit on the pricey end. Uh, Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on its third edition now. Um, everybody's heard of Oxford University, and <laughs> this is from Oxford Press, and it is clear, easy to read, um, top-notch scholarship. Mm -hmm. uh, every time I read an article, I've I learned something from it. It's yeah. it's great. That's true. Our next one is another suggestion by you, Jonathan. Why don't you go ahead and handle that one? Yeah. Um, this one is going to be a, a bit more of an evangelical uh, volume. The Oxford Dictionary is ecumenical and broad. Um, the New Dictionary of Theology by Sinclair Ferguson, David Wright, and uh, J.I. Packer. Again, uh, if you're listening out there, Dr. Packer, thank you for uh, <laughs> downloading the podcast. Um, it's a little briefer than Oxford Dictionary, and it's it focuses specifically on the history of theology. Hmm. Uh, so there are going to be... If there's an article on someone as a pastor theologian... Mm -hmm. uh, it will focus mainly on their theological contribution rather than their pastoral role. But again, it's a, a top-notch um, uh, dictionary, uh, well worth your, your time. Yeah. There's a similar volume that I'm going to suggest that um, is perhaps even more evangelical than the, the last one, if that, if that can be uh, the case. It's Walter Elwell's Evangelical Dictionary of Theology. I believe it's still in its second edition at this time. Yeah. It's, it's um, very accessible. Uh, it's widely available at pretty inexpensive prices because it's been out so long. Um, it's just, it's very solid and gives me a good um, starting line. Uh, whenever I read one of those articles, to to get going on research down a particular uh, line of thought, so that's that's a good one, and m probably many of our listeners have heard of or even used that. Uh, I was first exposed to it as a required textbook for a uh, a class I took in college. Yes, uh, our our theology professor in our undergrad. Uh, required us to read the dictionary. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Uh, but it it really did uh, help fill out some of the larger discussion we had mm -hmm. uh, related to those various topics. Uh, and dollar for dollar, it's probably the best investment of the, the ones we've listed so far. Hmm. Uh, well, the next one is another set that I've used quite a bit. Um, it's it's almost like a um, a conversation piece you put on your shelf, um, except it's one that you read. It's the Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture. Um, if you're unfamiliar with this series, the editors have gone through the church fathers and the um, anti-Nicene fathers and post-Nicene fathers and so on to collect comments and statements about particular passages or, uh, if they can, individual verses of Scripture throughout from throughout the Bible and collected them. So there's, um, there's a, a two-part set on the book of Genesis. And uh, mm -hmm. there's 
There's one on the um, pastoral epistles written by Paul, and so on and so forth. So you, what you get is you look up, um, let's say, the parable of the, of the prodigal son, and when you go to those pages, you find uh, all of these different ancient authors commenting on that passage. Everyone from Augustine to Origen to um, Thomas Aquinas, if you get some of the later sets. The ancient Christian commentary is the is the is basically the Church Fathers set. There's also a Protestant Reformation set and a medieval uh authors set and so on uh, but you can as you get these different sets you can find all like put together for you uh, to make it nice and easy what all of these different authors from history past have to say about that passage or that story or that verse so that one's pretty neat and there's a companion set that um, I have not used yet but Jonathan suggested it and it looks like a beast. It is humongous. It's these three, like, weaponized volumes. They're so thick. Uh, it's called the Encyclopedia of Ancient Christianity by Angelo Di Berardino, Thomas Oden, who recently passed away, and uh, Ilowski and Hoover. So this is... Can you talk about that a little bit, this companion set, Jonathan? Yes, um... Anybody who was in the ancient Christian commentary set um, or almost any movement or issue in uh, the first uh, six centuries of Christianity, you're going to find uh, an article in there. Um, it was originally an Italian work, uh, I believe, hmm. and has translated updated and revised um beautiful set uh but as adam said it's you know uh each volume is something like 500 pages it's <laughs> it's massive um and they're huge pages um but it it goes it works well with the um, the ancient Christian commentary because if you're reading through and wondering, oh, well, who is this uh, pseudo Dionysus the Areopagite? Well, <laughs> let's let's turn over and read his article, um, and right. so they inform each other. Whose commentary am I reading here? Mm -hmm. uh, the ancient Christian commentary set has been completed, and thus this encyclopedia has been completed. And it's very fine uh, patristic scholarship. Hmm. Uh, I, I can't recommend these enough. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to using them sometime. But we've got, we've got I, two more suggestions for you. Both of them are atlases. The first one is by Tim Dowley. This is the Baker Atlas of Christian History. Uh, Baker has published quite a few different atlases for religious studies over the years. Uh, but this one is a particularly solid one on the subject of church history specifically. It's a great overview atlas that covers all of Christian history. So there may be ones that are more precise, but if you're wanting, again, a good basic library starter, mm -hmm. this is something to have. Yeah. Our next one is not really a library starter, though, is it? This is more like a... That's a library... You let the library, an actual library, purchase this, and then you go borrow it. Yes, yes. This is the one that you drop into your local theological library, pour over, and, you know, help us keep our search stats up. Um, <laughs> this one is the New Historical Atlas of Religion in America by Edwin Scott Gostad. This is a giant beast of an atlas. <laughs> um, but 
it has a very uh, granular information about growth and development of religion in America, uh, the various different religious movements, uh, uh, how religion moved across, and what the regional impacts of religion were in the United States. Um, so it's well worth your time and investment if you're wanting to uh, work with uh, the history of religion in the United States. Which we, may become more interesting to a lot of folks after this election cycle, actually. Yes, uh, there are more. There are more Islamic adherents in the United States than there are um, uh, Episcopalians. <laughs> That's a a bit of an odd statistic. Yeah. Uh, but it's we we really should understand the religious landscape of our country uh, to make sure that when people are making claims about religion, we should hold people accountable for the truthfulness of their religious claims. Yeah. Uh, not just on like whether a religion is uh, historically uh, true, but you know what a religion does and practices. Right. Uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't critique people for things they don't actually believe right and these types of resources help us understand what what do people really believe in practice yeah yeah so if you if you feel challenged by what we said about not buying this you're welcome to spend two hundred dollars on the new historical atlas of religion in america uh, or swing by your local theological library to pick that up and make good use of it. I hadn't heard about that resource before Jonathan and, and I discussed it for this episode, and I personally am very interested in getting my hands on a copy sometime and pouring through it. And please visit your local theological library. Uh, your librarian won't bite. Uh, in fact, he'll probably be very happy to see, or she will be very happy to see you come through the doors. Well, I don't know. It depends whether they're charismatics, right? Like, they go pretty crazy when they're in the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, our next episode comes out in two weeks on January 13th. It will be the sixth episode of this second volume, and our focus next time is on the social sciences and historiography. How do they interact? Uh, what are their roles? It'll be, I think it'll be an interesting discussion. I agree. Perhaps our discussion of these resources and concepts has led you to, to some questions. Uh, feel free to email us at churchhistorypodcast at gmail.com. That's churchhistorypodcast. No spaces or hyphens or dots or anything like that at gmail.com. Uh, we want to make sure that we're meeting our listeners' needs and uh, we want feedback. So if you have any questions, please feel free to email us. That's right. And uh, we don't want to pester you every time. We'll stop announcing it at some point. But we just want to remind you that we have a new companion podcast out already. It's called Saints Gone Before. You can subscribe to it right now through iTunes or Google Play or uh, any other way that you listen to us. Saints Gone Before is an audiobook style podcast where we read Christian classics to you for anywhere from like nine minutes for our most recent episode up to like 20 minutes or so. So they're intended for something you can listen to in a, in a brief period of time. Um, our, our first episode and second episode discussed, uh, uh, not discussed, they presented a text from the early church. The, our third episode is our, uh, 
Christmas episode where we presented some lesser known Christmas carols and we'll present uh, some more of those on uh, on the the fourth episode which will come out uh, before actually this episode comes out <laughs> on iTunes and Google Play and everywhere else so uh, go subscribe to Saints Gone Before so you don't miss it there's no commentary no discussion of the sources it's just a simple, hey guys, this is what we're reading, and then we read it, and then we tell you what we read so that you can find it for yourself if you want to um, buy a copy of the book someday when we uh, read a book that's in the public domain, or uh, if you want to just read the, the short text like the Didache or the, the Christmas carols that we, we're reading at this point in the podcast's life. We're pretty excited about it. It's a great podcast. Uh it's designed to be a supplement to what we're doing here, and we think it will be beneficial and encouraging to your uh, your study and your uh, Christian life. That's right. So, and, uh, when we launch our third volume of this podcast, we're going to try and coordinate as best we can the readings in Saint Gone, Saints Gone Before with what we're talking about on this podcast it won't always line up perfectly but there will be a significant amount of overlap so that you can go back and forth and kind of wrestle with what was going on in that period of time if you want to hear some primary sources from the reformation we're going to try to get a diversity of sources uh not everything of the same genre so that you can get a good feel for the breadth of what was going on in the Reformation mm -hmm. and not just one narrow segment of of this important time period in the life of the church. Right. All right, well, I think we're going to sign off, Jonathan. Do you have anything else to say? Uh, thank you for uh, listening to us again. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Packer. It's been a blessing to you. <laughs> <laughs> May God bless you as you go. He's already gone before. Before.